Welcome to the Stoa. The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. by a Q&A and like hopefully this kind of good back and forth discussion. There's certainly a lot of stuff uh, happening in the world right now. And I don't think, I don't think uh, we'll, we'll be starved for events for the next few months. I think what's happening fundamentally is that most of the institutions we've grown to rely on are much more similar to a dry forest in the summer, right? At the start of a forest fire than perhaps we were willing to admit a year, two, three, four ago. Um, I still stand by my evaluation that the only thing really that might allow, allow us uh, out of this mess is to very, very quickly empower live players to rebuild key institutional, uh, key parts of the institutional framework. Now, we might have a problem. They might not be around. It's actually been quite a while since we had a society that was really conducive to, yes, personal power and personal ability to do things. Um, you know, I think it's often there is a desire for change without change makers. And that just never works. Even if we take the most anarchist approach or the most like, you know, say communitarian or, or even communist approach, right? As you saw during the Bolshevik revolution, there's no revolution without Lenin. And perversely, I think this might be one of the reasons we are stable despite everything being broken. One of the key reasons we are stable despite being everything, everything being broken is that there's no coordinating individuals who are capable of making it up as they go along. Rather, everyone's participating in a predetermined script. I'm going to say that the current protests are gonna have a very, very limited impact on society. Some people might think that's good. Many people think that's quite bad. There's after all an injustice to address. But the crucial thing is everyone in America that I know, no one's confused about what's happening. Everyone knows what the next step is. You know, everyone knows how to protest in a civil rights fashion and everyone knows how to participate in a race riot. Well, neither of those actually will change the American system, right? If they could, all the change that they could achieve has already been achieved. In fact, it was achieved in the 1960s when the uh, organizers of the protests were in a way, you know, both more violent and more pragmatic, right? The entire scope of action was open from, you know, so let's say Martin Luther King, who himself was somewhat ambiguous to say all the way to Malcolm X and then more moderate people uh, on the other side of King. And this approach made that a significant political faction in the United States. I think that the, the system was well hardened against any sort of popular revolt, either from the left or the right. I think the system is quite well hardened against any sort of civil or spontaneous unrest. The only thing that could possibly change our circumstances would be if a live player were to harness this unrest and yes, harness it for more than just an electoral victory for the Democrats. I don't think even anyone on the left believes that you know, Joe Biden winning results in a restructuring of American society so it's more just. They just see it as you know, closing a gaping wound. And I think for people on the right, they can't really believe that Donald Trump winning re-election fixes things either. So if neither people on the left or the right believe this, why are they dedicating all of their energy to such tiny, tiny incremental outcomes, to these importantly non-additive incremental outcomes? I think it's because they've been very, very thoroughly trained to only do things that they already know, to only do things that are not confusing, to only do things that follow scripts that honestly match Hollywood movies. If you've seen some of the city centers over the last two weeks, the scenes look straight out of Hollywood. That's not because Hollywood is super realistic. That's because I think we as, as citizens have become super unrealistic. We enjoy acting out these scenes that we've seen. We enjoy viscerally participating in what's primarily symbolic action instead of materially grounded action. We've lost the awareness that if you are to have organization or impact, you in fact have to have system designers, not just systems and that the system designers are necessarily themselves powerful people. 
You know, I think today, for example, you know, let's, let's imagine that, you know, either it's sort of the law and order style Nixon person, right? That sort of figure or the social change, you know, somewhat moderate Martin Luther King or the very, very radical, you know, Malcolm X verging on black nationalism. They're all impossible as individuals. All social systems would have selected against that personality type long before they ever, you know, get to a position to shepherd institutional resources. The basic thing is all our institutions have fleed risk as much as they can, as much as they possibly can, they've escaped the appearance of risk, especially financial risk. And in doing so, overburdened and overloaded on actual risk. So, because there has not been many good training environments for people of that type, uh, because most people veer from the unfamiliar towards the familiar. Like I can feel how the pressure dropped when we went from COVID, which was a natural disaster outside our power, or at least manifestly outside our power, to um, a, a civil conflict that was manifestly or allegedly in our power. We're back on track. No one would be confused in 2001 or 1991 or 1971 if we explained exactly what happened in the last two weeks. No one. Everyone would have been very confused had you tried to explain the events from February to May. So now we're enjoying a brief reprieve where we can pretend that the traditional 1960s ways of fixing things still work or the clamping down on the 1960s stuff that that's going to work. This is the beloved fantasy of left and right in America. And I think both of them are existing in this virtual reality, in this symbolic reality. So uh, with that, and with, as you can see, I'm not shying away from controversy at all. That's why I'm opening this week's session so directly, so on the nose. Uh, let's talk. What might statesmanship in America in 2020 look like? And I'm opening the full spectrum from Kissinger to Lenin here. So I just wanna hear ideas of what individuals that acquire power and use power to transform the system or repair it might look like. Any... One thing I've been thinking about that I would like really love to see mm -hmm. is a legit third party or something like some alternative to the polarized extremes that are happening right now. Um, and I don't know for sure if, I mean, it's kind of problematic. I'm like a pretty dyed in the wool Democrat. Uh, my parents are both Democrats. My communities are all Democratic. It's like very clear. I also think that basically any party that would make excuses for Donald Trump is like hopelessly morally bankrupt. So I definitely think that one party is worse than the other. But the narrative that I've kind of been fed my entire life as a young American is that um, no matter how frustrated I am with the Democrats or the left, they're the lesser of two evils. Um, and I am really kind of had it up to here with that narrative as someone who's been in Minneapolis for most of this situation. Like I'm just feeling really done with that. Um, and I'm really looking for something different. Well, what I would propose is that the system is essentially designed so electorally it's very difficult to have a third party. And of course, you might ask, like, so why is the system designed that way and so on? But I think that the core counterpoint to this I would make is that the next organized political transformation of America will not look like a political party. So I'm, I'm willing to, like, go back and forth on this and listen to it. But I note that, say, the Democrats or the Republicans look much less like a political party now in 2020 than they did in the year 2000. In the year 2000, right, or 2001, if we want to pick 9-11 as the Fisher point, they looked much less like political parties than they did in 1991. In 1991, they looked much less like political parties than they did in 1940. In what sense am I using the term political party? I'm, I'm using it in the sense of this political organization not yet in power that is in fact ready and willing to govern, right? I think it's it, this, this uh, political machine 
uh, first, you know, maybe pioneered in 19th century European democracies of the political party, slightly modified into this revolutionary form by Vladimir Lenin into, you know, have the revolutionary vanguard party. I think this machine has broken down. And I think it partially broke down because the system over time, like, you know, it, um, I think it was quite firmly locked down. It's not really possible to vote the bums out, like uh, someone might say in this very popular way. It's just not possible because the bums you can vote out are just bums and they've not been let near the control panels in your lifetime, right? I think that's just, you know, there, there are some minor exceptions to this. I think the president, you know, there's a phrase I heard somewhere, the president is the dictator of the world and the mayor of America, right? And there are issues if you try to invert that, if you try to make them the mayor of the world and the you know dictator of America, that that probably doesn't work. Um, but these are the the coordination within the Democratic Party is visibly lower than it was in the two thousands, and the Republican Party is visibly less coordinated and competent than it was in the two thousands, right? So we're not even talking here. I'm not even talking good or evil. I'm not even talking objectives. I'm just looking at we are seeing a system that's locked in a two-party configuration where the political parties are over time less and less politically powerful as organizations. What's the Democrat party line? What's the Republican party line? I don't know. I don't think anyone knows anymore. I think it's this weird miasma of, of like any sort of position and there's only limited ability to get people within a single political party to work together, which is what the political parties were at first, right? There were these mechanisms for for um, the creation of a governing structure. So I think that the next way American statesmen might work and that private citizens might work, it's going to look not like a political party, but it will be coordinated, it will be public, it will solicit public support, and it will enter government. And the question is, how does that happen if it's not, if it's not political? Uh, here we would propose that at the very least, one should consider the new conservatives. Now, I think the new conservatives issued disastrous foreign policy, but no one ever voted the new conservatives into power, yet they did speak to the public and they did enter government and they did have some limited support from parts of the public. And the, what they managed to do in, in this really crazy way was you know, achieve complete consensus between Democrats and Republicans on the, the very important question of should we invade Iraq? and a dozen other foreign policy questions, arguably say the Ukraine crisis in the Obama years and you know the early Trump years was still basically uh, handled in line with their preferences. So they're a very flawed model, but they're a real model. So whatever that is, I think we should study that and perhaps it needs a new name in political science. Very curious if you have any thoughts because I, I hope I was addressing the substance of your question. Right, it can be very tricky. Okay, great. Um, anyone wants to go? Con wants to go next? Yeah, we have uh, Dan. Um, you you asked uh, what might statementship in America in twenty twenty look like, and I mm -hmm. think a far better question. Somehow that that question doesn't make sense to me in 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 light of what we're looking at. Um, there's a burgeoning global peer-to-peer -peer movement, the commons, the cosmo global, cosmo local movement that's happening around the world, looking at building up the commons as a space, not just the market and the state, but the commons coming into with, you know, strong neighborhoods, this sort of uh, thing. And so you mentioned systems designers, and I completely agree with that. But the question is, what kind of systems designers? And so my question is, how can we help these system designers, whatever sorts we're talking about, how can we help them, because they do exist, to gain this political power? Well, when we talk about system designers, right, I, I think we're either talking about prophets, oligarchs, or statesmen. And, and of the three, I'm like most in favor of, of, of statesmen, because here's, here's a Vitalik Buterin's problem, for example, creator of Ethereum. If Ethereum can possibly work, he's going to have to be an oligarch. If Ethereum, uh, you know, if he doesn't want to be an oligarch, I think Ethereum won't work as the next currency. Uh, there's this vast reality that any system, I think, requires the exercise of power to be implemented. 
I've not seen any system be adopted without the exercise of power. And if power is exercised in a coordinated way, then that's the power in the hands of, of an individual, right? Or a small clique of individuals, because I've seen nothing else. Yeah, but I guess it comes to the implementation of full new systems, right? Now, the creation and the dreaming up of new systems, that, that can be done by others, right? You could have, you could have um, someone develop very extensive political theory or social theory or a new ethical movement, but then someone else would have to organize the basis of that ethical movement, and that person would invariably be powerful, right? So when I say profit, right, you, that can almost, you know, let me put it this way. I think that, um, you know, M MLK, for example, was certainly using spiritual energy, not just political energy. And I think it's a mistake by say, you know, modern liberals or conservatives to ignore this. I think modern conservatives want to ignore his, his ties to communism and, and modern liberals want to ignore how much the theology of Christianity helped MLK achieve what he did, right? So I would consider him at least 10% prophet um, or, or preacher or reverend or whatever um, he was. But this, this, uh, this idea of the self-organizing system I think is very important. But then the question is who is designing or building a self-organizing system? I think this is an act of engineering. And ultimately such a system might transcend an individual designer. In fact, it must. And it might transcend a small group of implementers. It must, but the, the, the moment of its creation, like that just has to be done um, directly. Like there's this very interesting, you know, I know Machiavelli has a bad reputation and that's, I think, because his humor doesn't translate that well from Italian to English. Like in English, he's playful and almost sarcastic. Sorry, in, in Italian, he's playful, sarcastic. You know, you can tell that he has moral principles in addition to the analysis. But the most interesting line, I think it's from the discourses, right? So it's not from the prince that I ever read was, uh, you know, a new political system, be it a principality or republic is always the work of a single man. I found that deeply insightful, right? And, and in a very important way, you know, maybe in the American Revolution, we would consider George Washington to be that person, or, you know, maybe someone like Hamilton or whatever. Uh, but, you know, they had a choice point as to w what kind of system to contribute their energies to. So in that moment, it was their decision. It wasn't the decision of the American people. They put it, we the people. But who is this we the people? Who is this we the market? Whose hand is the invisible hand that moves the market, right? And who, who is the person that gets to say we? It's not said by 300 million people simultaneously. Someone is speaking, right? So that'll kind of be my, my, my pushback. I would say, yes, it's good to mind the commons, but I think the commons can only be shepherded, administered, extended, rebuilt, uh, through the work of individuals and the process of building them, if only for a short time, those individuals become immensely powerful. Cool. Perhaps next question. Yeah, we've got James. Yeah, Miss hey, Hamel. Hey. Uh, there's a lot of like like you said, what what might what comes next might not look like a political party. Uh, which I think ties into this question because there's a lot of attention in discussions like this around national politics, um, the presidency, who's, who's going to be the president, what parties in, in, in control of the House, control of the Senate. Um, but uh, it seems like a lot of the like, decisions on the ground are being made in local governance. And at the same time, in local governance, the political parties of the individual members Members matters much, much less than, uh, or holds much less sway than in a lot of national politics, where you have a council of five people that are all, you know, they, they all live in this small town and, and um, the party holds less sway. There's less towing the line there, maybe. Um, so I'm wondering what your thoughts on are, um, your thoughts on local governance and what uh, nationally organized local politicians looks like. I think the national organization aspect, right? Like it's sort of like, you know, it's, um, I think there's, um, hmm. I think that the local politics aspect would matter immensely if people tracked local material reality 
and people still were invested in their local social community rather than existing as much as they do on the symbolic level. So perhaps the first thing to consider is that a return to the local reality that's under their control, that might be very interesting. Um, and then what might this look like? I think it would have to be through a fragmentation of media. I just can't see them. I just can't see people ever ungluing their eyes from the screen, right? Stopping to read newspapers, ceasing to consume mass produced entertainment. So I think they're stuck consuming entertainment. And I think the entertainment shapes them. And I think they on a subconscious level act primarily on the entertainment rather than the reality. And then the entertainment's always gate kept one way or another. So free refragmentation of media uh, followed by essentially this strong focus on at least local symbolic action that builds up power centers. Because the key thing is that, you know, the key trick that I think is often played is we are against power, so we're removing all visible power. And if you remove all, all visible power, then the only power that exists in the system is the invisible or hyper-centralized power, right? So you actually get a super-centralized society that nominally, you know, everyone is equal, but Augustus is first citizen, right? Or Napoleon is first citizen. Everyone is equal, but Comrade Stalin's like a little bit more equal than everyone else. And you can't really remove Comrade Stalin by calling out your other comrades as problematic. In fact, if you're calling out your other comrades as problematic, you're definitely helping Stalin, right? Like he's, he's definitely collecting a list. So this is like a very totalitarian metaphor, but we see a non-totalitarian societal equivalent to this, this kind of like beige, gray consensus of neoliberalism that is now, you know, it's, it's basically defeated, right? Like, and I'm not sure what happens next, but the next thing is by default still going to be super scaled in the media landscape. So, okay, without scaling back the media landscape to smaller projects and smaller packages of consumption and less bundled media consumers, uh, I just can't see people caring about local action, even though it, it in theory should influence them so much. Um, maybe a follow-up question, James. Does that feel like it touches on uh, on the topic? Uh, yeah, I think I think it touches on the topic. I think it seems very much related to kind of the you know um, you know back 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 to the back to the land movement that we're that we're seeing from a lot of or, or hearing from a lot of, of different sides of folks. Um, this kind of hyper local um, you know let's step out of this broken system and build our little pocket mm -hmm. of of, of um, you know, patchwork utopias. Um, it's, it seems quite related because that's another, that's a form of local governance. Um, and that's an extreme of breaking that media landscape, as you said, like, let's cut off, like, let's, you know, really separate ourselves, not from the electrical grid, um, but from the social grid, uh, and, and really look right where we are. Um, and that seems, um, like you said, that centralizes power because, you know, you're, you're effectively cutting off any voices that go off into their pocket from, from the state that must still exist that's controlling whatever land your pocket lives on, uh, that sort of thing. So um, I'd, be I'd be interested to hear um, media fragmentation um, trends and or... Um, um, efforts that, that you've seen uh, or that, that have excited you about the, you know, if, if immediate fragmentation is, is, is what you think brings local politics back into a, a meaningful place, like, is that happening? You think you see it happening? Any hope of that? Not by default. I've not seen, you know, I think um, it's the nature, it's the nature of these networked spaces that you never exit them, right? No one wants to leave uh, a corner of the media space that they, you know, that they feel is unfair to them to go somewhere else. What they primarily want to do is stay and talk to the other people, even if they consider them enemies, right? So humans are like super agglomerative. The closest I've seen is uh, this almost subcultural differentiation 
where you might see corners of Twitter or corner, corners of YouTube. They're just completely mutually unintelligible, right? So the sort of sequestration through obscurity, through subcultural idiom, through um, tiny boutique uh, writers or thinkers, you know, various kind of groups with a cult following, if you, if you say it, if you think about it, like these, these cult followings that are honestly like very much countercultural. Uh, they don't want the normie to come. They don't want the normal person to come in. Uh, they actually want to keep it small and exclusive. Uh, and I think they prefer it that way. So some of those groups will remain stable, though I wonder, you know, I think pseudonymity is, uh, is losing very badly, right? The internet was basically pseudonymous by default in 2005, possibly as late as 2010, but by 2012, definitely, you know, the normal respectable thing was to speak on the internet with your own name and your own face. And the subcultures can still develop in interesting ways, as you might see on various Twitter accounts. Um, but I think at this point, we're almost suspicious of the, of the you know, unnamed masked user. For, we want their name. Reason, perhaps. perhaps, yeah. You know, you know? Strong idiosyncratic subcultures um, with like reputation systems baked into rooted to identity seems required for like real like long-term building as a, as a group. Maybe. Yeah, this is, this is certainly true, but note this also makes them legible and susceptible to economic pressure, right? Yeah, if I can jump in for a sec, just a very quick observation. I've actually done a bunch of research mm -hmm. on anonymity and pseudonymity on the internet, and there's no evidence that, um, sorry, the sun here is weird. There's no evidence that um, requiring real name usage improves politeness of conversation or like any of the other stuff that people say it does. Oh, that's very and important. Many of the backers of those policies are companies like Facebook, which benefit in some ways from people being required to use real names for whatever reason. Um, I can drop an article that I wrote about this in the chat, but I just think it's Please, a really I'd important it. point um, that is usually not acknowledged in these conversations. Yeah, I think it's really interesting in like quality of conversation kind of, that's what you're talking about, right? Like politeness and, and like civ civility of conversation. I wonder how it affects the ability to affect material change as like an organized group of people though. That's, I, that's yeah, I wonder that uh, as opposed to just like conversational quality. I think the, uh, the creation of blacklists for hiring is super important and an unremarked upon feature of American life where once it was worthy of a scandal, right? Like the blacklisting of the, um, you know, people with, with say Marxist tendencies in 1950s Hollywood. Now we just expect of everyone a, a clean record of social media behavior. Well, the only way you can possibly have a clean record of social media behavior is to have either have no social media behavior um, you know, over a period of 20 to 30 years of changing norms where presumably started using it as a teenager with raging hormones and little life experience, uh, possibly getting, getting involved in different subcultures. It's like, you know, if we continue to cling to that standard of requiring like clean behavior online in pseudonymous contexts, you know, I think this is going to be very, very oppressive and stifling. I think we're actually going to see very little cultural innovation. And in that case, we might be stuck repeating the 20th century forever, uh, even as it works less and less well, since the material circumstances diverge from those that created these meme plexes. Um, cool. Can we go to Peter's comment? Yes. Hey, Zemo, this is just uh, riffing off of your comment on local politics. Um, so if I understand correctly, what you're saying is that there is still a lot of interesting work, a lot of interesting moves that could be made on yes. the local level, um, but uh, people get distracted by the shiny things. Um, uh, and not, 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 not quite, not quite. I said uh, symbolic. Symbolic space seems more important to them than actual concrete physical space. Let me explain. Um, the difference is you can have someone that's extremely intellectual, that is like, you know, really focuses very heavily, does a lot of thinking, does a lot of research, but what they choose to think about or research, right? And later what they choose to manage, what they choose to give money into is something that exists in this shared symbolic reality rather than something that's like local and concrete. 
I think for many people it is distraction, but I'm not positing distraction as such. I'm positing like this orientation to a causal action almost, right? So a, a different frame I could put on it, and then I'll let you finish your question if it still applies, mm -hmm. is imagine extremely severe brain drain where the smartest local organizer in every village they don't or town, they don't necessarily all go to New York, but they all mentally direct their energy to what's happening in New York. Right, they're virtually brain drained, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Sure. Yeah, I think the question still applies, which is that if there's real power to be had on a local level, that seems to imply that any uh, small number of people, any group that can coordinate to work on local politics, maybe create a narrative in which local politics is symbolically meaningful to them, that might be a necessary groundwork. Um, then yeah. But, but let me emphasize again, what does the machinery of local politics look like? It, it, you know, to be fair, running for mayor maybe isn't terrible, but it's like, you know, maybe the, the most powerful person in San Francisco isn't the mayor of San Francisco, right? Mm -hmm. Sure, but if you're positing that there's brain drain to national politics where there's very little leverage, and then people mm -hmm. are ignoring uh, politics on the local level, which perhaps they have more leverage, um, that seems to imply that there's, you know, a, 10 million, $100 million bills lying on the sidewalk yes. for anyone who can do that sort of local entrepreneurship. I very much think there are. Now, for, for most towns, it's not going to be 100 million, right? But um, definitely, there are honestly trillion dollar bills lying on the floor of Seattle, San Francisco, LA, possibly even New York. Yeah, right. well, yeah, curious if you had any thoughts on what the sort of machinery for that. Be, be, the alternative hypothesis, of course, is that most power has been drained to the center, and so people are mm -hmm. rationally ignoring local politics. Um, but mm -hmm. I take it that's not your view. Well, I think that the, the periphery still remains far more illegible than the center, um, than the center would like to claim it is. I think most people have no idea how things are done in Chicago or how things are done in New Orleans. And I think most of the federal government doesn't. I think the federal government has a very fragmented awareness of reality. Um, I think that, yes, there is an aspect of like, a, you know, a vetocracy where everyone can say no. The center is not managing anything, but can say no to anything being done. So I think in that way, power has perhaps been drained. But on the other one, I think it's far more the case that we're radically more risk averse than we once were. No one's going to convince me that the risk reward profile was more favorable for say, for say Bolshevik revolutionaries under czarist Russia than it is for American citizens trying to get ahead in life in 2020. I really don't believe that. I, I just think that there's something happening where their ability or desire to engage with power has atrophied. So, Here's an interesting possibility. What if we have, in fact, achieved the stabilization of the world through a severe deformation of the human spirit? What if the true problem was not wanting things? I think I, I know this is like, again, a little bit controversial in, in, in a stoic context, right? I certainly just, I want to consider something there, right? I want to consider whether it is possible that the people who are following national politics fundamentally just want to observe and don't actually want to change, that they're quite, they're rational in a different way. They don't wish to participate. They're just mildly nihilistic, but they want to be seen as, as virtuous and as participating and as active. So it's easier to participate in a virtualized variant of national politics than it is to, you know, maintain local, local stuff. Self-domestication maybe. Yeah. Yes. Over self domestication. I mean, Ted Kaczynski would call it. What was it? Um, over socialization. Over socialization. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, thanks, Emma. Yep. Thank you Great. for asking. Great question. Rachel, would you like to ask your question? Oh, uh, Rachel, your microphone's off. Um. Yes. Yeah, so when we were talking about um alternative governments before, um, I know some of us have read the diamond age and we kind of we have these ideas about like um technology and what we can do with um mm -hmm. alternative government systems um where do you see that going if people are 
basically like creating their own government systems um, with software. What what is what 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 could happen? Like, isn't that like just mm. such an untapped world? And where where do you see yourself in that? Yeah, I think I'm still disappointed that the cypherpunk dream never came to be. Um, and I think that the key thing that's happening is that the creators of software, for some reason, again, they fear or don't want personal power. Like if they did, the creators of software could be far more powerful in the world than they are. Let's remember, um, you know, the original 1999 Matrix movie was promising people that they can fight their corporate job and the government by being hackers. Like that's basically the, the terrible life Neo is broken out of is the cubicle, right? Like that's the grayness the suit. And I think today that grayness and that suit look like a hoodie and it's not a cubicle, but it's an open office floor layout and they're Nerf guns and you know, they deliver you avocado toast, but fundamentally you're paid very, very well to be a, you know, pet that doesn't cause trouble. Ideally, you're not even developing new products. You're just making the old products work. And a startup environment, though, on the other hand, that potentially could still be a route to power. But I feel that's also become this very hollowed out thing where, where the startups are becoming more cookie cutter. So the question I would ask back is, so okay, who are the people who both still want power who are not interested in participating in the normal government or corporate game and have the technical talent. Because I think we're really atrophying in our understanding of computers. I think people who are right now 20 years old, like they probably have to learn how to properly use a keyboard right first and maybe figure out what a file system is before they can start writing software. Like I think, I think maybe not 20, let's say 15 well, year olds. Say someone was creating hypothetically a piece of alternative government software we could like succeed mm -hmm. technologically from the current game they infrastructure, right? Um, and they had Certainly it. Would be possible. And, and they, they were building it, and they were, they were like doing little things to make it happen. Um, but it, it didn't really like have a sense of um, worldliness, you know. Um, what would you see the the possibility um, for like advancing in, into like different forms of technology, like as a way to build alternative government systems, um, even if it's just like people enjoying their, you know, like little micro society on um, like through technology would that be a, a viable thing I, th I think that's definitely viable the reason why i think that's viable is because we see very tiny weak variants of this with very niche um bespoke online communities where people basically produce a different emotional life and a different intellectual life that's not been generated by market forces or by government propaganda right so that could happen um but again i really think it's and what would that, how would that work? I think that, you know, if you could somehow cause invisible coordination or no, if you could somehow cause bureaucratically invisible coordination, I think it actually doesn't take much to take, to take things over at all or to break away into your freedom. I think that the floor on this, however, is like kind of the level of coordination, right? So whatever software technology produces this coordination between the individuals has to be at least as good as the new conservative capture of US foreign policy in the early 2000s, or, you know, let's, let's say Scientology, right? With Operation Snow White. People don't know that, but, you know, the Church of Scientology managed to infiltrate several level, levels of the US government in what they termed Operation Snow White, where they just went and got hired in government bureaus and then destroyed government documents on the Church of Scientology. Like, were such an effort successful, the federal government would have effectively forgotten about the, Sci the Church of Scientology. Now talk about like that, that would possibly make a very good book, like an alternate 2020, where the, the deep state is the Church of Scientology. <laughs> Maybe it has its own Epstein's too. Possibly next question. Yeah, let's move to Mimetic Caper. So what's the, uh, the question? Hi, sorry. Hey. Uh, so I'm just gonna post it again here. Um, you've said that it takes individual live players to wield power and build institutions, mm -hmm. um, but could this be a norm, but not a rule? Uh, I wonder if perhaps what's really required is a, a living meme or idea rather than any individual player. Part, part of the thinking here is that um, 
it's very difficult for a meme to stay alive. Like it's almost uh, as soon as somebody copies it, it becomes a bit of a cargo cult version of the original living meme, right? Mm -hmm. It gets lost in groupthink. It uh, it loses a bit of its life. Well, really depends here what you mean by living meme. Do you perhaps mean something that's like this, um, like very generative, true transmission uh, of knowledge, or do you mean something closer to the concept of, of an egregore, where it's like a distributed intelligence? Um, I, I think I could go with either of those. Um, okay. I'm not, I'm not sure about the exact definitions. Well, I always think that the sociology of thinking about superorganisms is tricky, right? Superorganisms in the sense of like these, these transhuman objects that allegedly might already exist, where it's, you know, groups of people behaving as if they have an emergent intelligence beyond, beyond that of, you know, individual intelligence. I think that since the sociology of that is tricky, I'm like very hesitant to say let me put it this way, I can't rule it out. I would not necessarily bet on it uh, because it seems that there is a huge difficulty in the transmission of information between people. I think we have an easy time transmitting shallow information, but a harder time transmitting complex or deeply emotionally moving information, which I think makes the transmission of, and I'll be mechanism agnostic here, of what you might term life memes, very difficult. Um, again, you know, arguably there might be an exception with something like religious fever, right? Uh, that might be like living memes of a certain type. Uh, and that might be hyper adaptive, it might be self modifying, you know, autopoietic is perhaps another term people like to use. Uh, but I've seen little evidence uh, of these things. So yes, it might be a norm. It might be a norm. It's possible there's some key innovation that would enable these to proliferate, radically changing how our world works. But then I have to ask, you know, would engaging in runaway mimetic evolution be actually good for us humans? That's certainly debatable. Um, I, I tend to believe so, but, uh, you know, that's my personal belief. Well, th thank you for the question. I certainly am not averse to checking out other frameworks and debating people in other frameworks, so. Very good. All right, Anish. Mm -hmm. Hi, am I uh, visible and audible? Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I'll just read out the question because since I spent a sing significant amount of time saying it, um, one thing that I have noticed and I want to bring to salience is that there are some, I think, upstream factors when it comes to how effective life players are and um, one of them, which um, I found is, you know, a big locus of the current polarization is how we socialize people to construe um, the self and the demands placed upon the self in order to coordinate at all. Like in the caricatured big version, um, it's, uh, it's all just oppression. And, uh, you know, even the smallest inconvenience is an intolerable violation in the caricatured um, uh, uh, conservative version, it's an eternal virtue. If you don't conform to and submit to absolutely, you're just a terrible person. And um, there's not much of a discussion, like both of these are locked in conflict and they seem to be the only alternatives as opposed to, oh yeah, there are trade-offs and um, different individuals have different set points. There are costs to having different set points, you know, in, in both coordination as well as autonomy terms. And um, being in the Bay Area, this is very salient. And if you, and one thing that I've noticed is that even the smallest coordinations, which I found very trivial when I was in India, like for people getting along without strife in um, a group house, for example, or just, you know, together for some reason, seem to require monumental management of um, like the most trivial individual concerns, uh, which normally would really not be a thing. So, um, it's very difficult for live players to operate in such an environment because the usual mechanisms for actually building anything, right? Like the pieces out of which you will build the, tip, the, the timber has, one might say, become a bit too crooked. Um, so. 
what's your view on this? Because I see an institutional abdication of this. It's just they seem to have, you know, just like completely forgotten that part of their job is to help people get to the point where they can coordinate in bigger numbers. Well, yeah, again, this is sort of like, I think the learning environment and the selection environment, these are two separate things that they can coincide, has been very unfavorable to live players, right? Learning environment being where's your sandbox, right? Where's your proving ground? Where's your, you know, um, cursus honorum um, where mistakes can be made and mistakes don't necessarily haunt you 20 or 30 or 40 years later. Mm -hmm. You know, if you could disqualify the Julius Caesars of the world or the, you know, or the, uh, the uh, Feynman's of the world by things that they said to their friends at 25 or 20, well, there wouldn't be many of them now, would there, right? Like almost all of them have these really crazy swings through their life when they're learning stuff. And they already are causing real consequences, of course, like it doesn't absolve them of that, but um, you're not supposed to be the teacher's pet. And today I think you are supposed to be the teacher's pet. So there's the, the learning aspect is not encouraged because you're a problematic person, either in a corporate environment, at the boardroom, you know, it's like dissent isn't rewarded, but even making the conversation awkward isn't rewarded either in the boardroom or the classroom. So you have to really ask yourself, right? Like at which point might someone going through a law career be like, firmly rewarded. And I'm going to say law is actually better than a lot of other domains. I'm going to say something rather perhaps interesting here. It's like, you know, lawyers have more diverse political views than say software engineers. And I think that's because they have a higher comfort with power, right? Um, and a higher comfort with power, you show your idiosyncrasies, you don't hide them. Um, and so the selection effect on the other end though is being, you know, what does the admission system select for? What does promotion select for? Mm -hmm. So I think that a lot of these live players at the early stages, we try as hard as we can to disable them. And I think perhaps, you know, the obstacle course has just grown too difficult. But the fun fact is this obstacle course was built by live players in the first place. And eventually it'll come crumbling down. The question is only how catastrophically, right? And what level of skill and organization will you have available around there? Um, and I, I honestly think most of them don't even realize that they have a role in, in grooming or enabling the next generation, right? I think they take these structures that they lived in as immutable laws of nature. They don't believe them to be the work of, uh, of human hands. Much like the medieval thought of the massive building syndrome. Right, very much so. Yeah, the work of giants, right? Yeah. Like, you know, in, um, in uh, early medieval Europe, uh, Roman ruins would often be attributed to giants, much as in classical Greek, Greece, Mycenaean ruins were attributed to giants uh, because the idea of like organizing such construction efforts, it's like, you know, seems ludicrously wasteful, right? You perceive them as a feature of the natural landscape like mountains. So my um, concern was a follow on with that as in even if we assume an environment where life players are not fully weeded out they still need humans capable of coordination to mm -hmm. be the material of which the systems are made and there's such people are in very short supply right now yeah yeah yeah, yeah. like but i do think you can find them i think it's possible to use online sort of communities and create communities where, where such people might be found i also think that there's an underappreciated thing that's extended america's lifespan um, this is like trite, but it's only trite because people take a watered down version of it. This idea that immigration replenishes America. Well, if you look at the people who shaped America in the 1940s, almost none of them were born in America except for FDR and the core, the core Democrats. Like if you look at all the scientists, right? Or if you look at the 50s, 60s, and 70s, all the cultural creatives and the organizer types, they, uh, they come from these European and East Asian societies after the societies are essentially defeated, right? Or crumble, like they either flee chaos or, you know, or they try to, try to make do after they're defeated. And this, uh, this method means that, in fact, around the world, there are still places where live players have an easier time arising, right? So I don't think you 
actually in a modern context ever see anything like a barbarian invasion, but you might easily have it be so that, you know, the, the, elites, of, the, elites, of Armenia, uh, the elites of Armenia are just like actually trained on power politics and they move to the US and wield a disproportionate influence or say <laughs> Cuban refugees. Like for example, I think it might be a very good idea for the US to, uh, you know, accept 3 million people from Hong Kong because they expect those 3 million people to produce uh, individuals who are way better at running, you know, way better at maintaining power than the typical American is. Right, and they have an ecosystem. It like because it's a mass migration, it's effectively importing an entire um, living ecosystem. It, it, it import, import an entire l ruling class, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think I think what I'm implicitly saying here is a little bit controversial. Is that you know the immigration of the ruling class prolongs the life of empire? Like this is one of the advantages of Byzantium, right? So again, there are these bypasses, right? You can do. Um, but they are they are bypasses and they're all rather awkward and the the conditions of the superstructure can't persist forever and then the question is well when does it burn down they're also not Perhaps. sustainable yes um, in the sense that there is at the moment one america which is you know post-war order and if your hypothesis is taken seriously there's it's actually possible that a lot of the a lot of it is i mean i won't go so far as to say parasitic but um the fact that the third generation migrant cannot do what their grandparent did. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's a real loss in some sense. Well, it's kind of weird, right? Why is it possible for immigrant communities to come to the US and set up their own parallel social and economic base and trade favors, yet it's not possible for people who are born in America? Mm, yeah. It's really weird, right? Something's happening here. I think that in an important way, though, I don't want to focus on America. The, all the critiques I levied also apply to Europe. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's, uh, they apply quite strongly to Western Europe. So I think that there's no, there are some simple changes. Again, if you could relocalize the media landscape, I think you would have way more people engaging with cultural production. And if people are engaging with cultural production, some of them graduate to engaging with social engineering. Alternatively, if there were opportunities for like, you know, combat of some kind, that might also produce such elites, but there are a few opportunities like that. Uh, very difficult to keep those around. Cool, shall we go to the next question? Yeah, we have Anjan. Um. My question is, can you just keep riffing on that? That's really interesting, the importation of the, the ruling classes or good people from other countries. Curious if you had more to say. Okay. Um, you take people who have had radically different early life experiences and radically different information about the world, and we're allowed to make their mistakes in a different system of accounting. So if you have a system of accounting where mistakes are penalized, you know, let's let's look at someone like Slavoj Žižek, for example. I'm just going to name him because uh, there's there's uh, been reading some of his stuff lately. Uh, in Yugoslavia, right? Even though he was a communist, he was barred from teaching on a blacklist, right? So he graduated, he had postgrad program, he went through it, and was utterly unemployable uh, because of his political views. He was advocating the wrong type of communism. This reputation, this sort of negative blacklist that was a result of him learning, thinking, and sometimes saying the wrong thing didn't weigh him down at all in the Western world. If anything, the Western world perversely, like it helped him, right? Because he had the patina of being a dissident. I think this uh, learning environment and escaping the initial learning environment so you make your mistakes early into a different environment allows you kind of to start with a clean slate. That's one mechanism. The other mechanism is you are exposed and lack, you're exposed to really different life experiences and you don't share any of the unstated assumptions of a society. Number three, I think that also there's this, uh, there's this legitimately different base of knowledge you might have. H Henry Kissinger was steeped in history because he grew up in a German environment in a way that no post-war German or American ever could be, right? And then this, this kind of thoughtfulness, I think, changed his view of things, right? And then one can say good or negative things about what he did, but I think, again, the reality was very much, very much there. 
Um, so I think there's also, of course, a selection effect where to leave a country that's unstable is itself only something you can exercise with quite a bit of privilege to begin with. So it's, uh, it's, it's usually has some selection pop, pop pressures there. And I think number five, you know, as a fourth, the fifth kind of factor is, well, all the people that leave with you are themselves a network who suddenly feel hungry again. So their skills might be the skills of someone who's mid-level in a different system, but they come over as a group and they're low level. They feel that hunger, right? And they want to work together to go further than they went before. Cool. Next question. So I'm sorry, if you don't mind me asking a quick follow-up, um, are sure. there any non-obvious, like if you were in charge, are there any non-obvious policy changes that you think would come out of your view about immigration? I think the US is pretty efficient at harnessing the talent of various countries. Um, I think that I would probably attempt freedom of movement with allied countries, but then only closely allied countries. That might actually speed things up notably. There's more circulation of elite within the European Union, though they all end up going to dysfunctional Brussels. Uh, but it does happen. There's a brain drain from the small countries like, you know, my native Slovenia or the Czech Republic or Portugal or Denmark, where the people who feel themselves talented or ambitious no longer aspire to the peaks of national politics. So they don't want to be the president of Portugal. They might actually want to be a, a commissioner in Brussels. So if hypothetically you imagine freedom of movement with Europe, the result would be a bunch of random Europeans who otherwise would have tried to become the French president or prime minister of Britain, suddenly trying their best to try to be governors of a particular US state or to become mayors of New York. Uh, this obviously doesn't work because if you attempted to do something like this with China, the result is the communist party now governs two countries. So one has to be careful as well with importation of elites, right? That's really interesting. Thanks, Emma. Great. We're coming up to the top of the hour, but we do have one question here that's been upvoted by Tyson. Do you mind answering it? Okay, what's uh, the question? Tyson, do you want to ask a question? question? Yeah, sure. Um, the question is about the sandbox, and it was also open to hearing what people might pop in the chat, but the STOA and um, like practices like freestyle and practices and self-expression and dialogue have been this new sandbox of sorts for me. And so I'm just curious about other um, ways that the sandbox is showing up that maybe I'm missing or not aware of. It could be geographical communities. It could be um, practices or modalities. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm just curious, like where are the best sandboxes for truly experimenting, playing, making mistakes, discovering. Twitter anonymity, if you can keep it. <laughs> so, but only if you can keep it, right? Because otherwise you're, you're producing, producing issues for yourself. Um, I, as a policy, don't, don't have any pseudonymous alts because I, I just think that it's like too dangerous um, if, if you end up being observed. But in a very deep and important way, I think the internet allowed some of this the key problem is it kind of misdirects attention in the same way I was describing of the symbolic where, where you're kind of, you're, you're plugged into the matrix and you forget your physical surroundings. This means that for the most part, it's actually extremely difficult, you know, to uh, both experiment in a way that has uh, access to economic levers or even to social fabric that might be useful or strategically deployable. So I would suggest online meetup groups. So you create, you create this discussion, you search for unusual people, and then in an urban center, you start up a group of people who you met online. Uh, you try your best to get to know them as people, try to vet for those of bad character, and try to have regular gatherings, and eventually real projects. So real projects, ideally construction. If you can't do construction, um, some sort of, you know, cultural activity or event thrown by this group. 
for people that they know from everyday life, right? So either mint the social capital by bringing together a bunch of individuals to organize an event that's not aimed at the other internet people, but is aimed at local community members or bring together the internet people and construct something physical. Doesn't matter what it is, right? And these two, I think are super fruitful generators for learning things. Uh, you'll learn slightly different things, but one will definitely learn things that way. And I think the initial selection has to be sourced online and to online intellectual experimentation uh, because the, the native environment is so impoverished for people who have the excess energy or, or will to do this. Or honestly, the mental health at this point. You know, people talk about the mental health crisis. You know, perhaps, perhaps we're actually just living in a, in a society where, where everyone has profound issues. Thank you. Really appreciate you for being here in this last couple of sessions. Really enjoying it. Thank you. Um, and thank you to everyone for these great, great questions. Uh, I always strive to try to be concise. I always fail, but at least hopefully the questions were addressed. Great. So we can catch you next week at the same time. Look forward to it. I'm sure there will be plenty to talk about then. Uh, any final words for us, Samo, before I tell people about upcoming events? Right. For a, for a concluding thought, I think the cr produce an environment where you might make mistakes and when you can do something completely different than what's acceptable in your current social circle. Just try to do it. Um, and then if you can introspect on what this does for you and also uh, if possible don't avoid power like try to accept power i think we've been told that exercising and having power is bad precisely because the top doesn't want any competition and i think we for the sake of everyone right there has to be competition there thank you right on Great. And so just a heads up for tomorrow, we have Biomotive Framework, an introduction with Doug, and that's going to be at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, tomorrow, I'm also hosting Socratic Speed Dating. So if you really want to talk with people <laughs> about what's been going on, um, it's you know, going to be an hour of open discussion and questioning one another. So totally would uh, invite everybody to come to that. And that is at uh, 7 p.m. Eastern time. And we see the STOA as a gift. And uh, if you would like to give a gift in return, you can visit us at the STOA uh, at the gift economy. And thank you all so much for being here.